Welcome to the Atheist Christian Book Club, February. Uh, our book this time is uh, by Anthony Flew, and it is There Is a God. Um, how, how many of you have gotten to read at least part of it? Okay. How many got to read the whole thing? Great. Excellent. <coughs> oh, how many people saw the debate? I did. Paul saw the road wreck, which was a... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you sweat it terrible? Terrible. I thought, um, you know, I thought it was great. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, right. I love that when the black preacher has to defend slavery. He's like, did, did he recommend the John Anchor? It was that bad. I think he's oh, talking about the other one. Oh, okay. he's, he's talking about the one that I sent out by the email. Yeah. With, with, oh, no, with versus oh, never mind. I thought we were talking about the Bible group. Story. I thought John Ankelberg was going to, and Gary Hayron was going to read him the four spiritual laws and <laughs> to invite him to accept Jesus. I mean, it was pitiful. That wasn't the point, right? Yeah. That was their point. <laughs> well, the. Um, was a hidden hard fact. But I mean, when you're in a debate and Anthony Flew goes, boy, that's a good point. That's magnificent. I know. Um, I thought he was. I, he seemed like he was not with it. Let no. me. I, I talked. To, I talked to Gary Habermas about this, and uh, I asked him which. <laughs> there were three debates, and Habermas said, "Get the first one at liberty," um, because he was already beginning to have second thoughts on the last two, and he said the last one's the worst. He said it, the atheists were complaining. Put anybody up there, draw a name, and uh, uh, so. The first one was he was, was when he was the, the most uh, adamant about where, where he about being an atheist. And he was already having he wouldn't like did you notice he did, like wouldn't commit to almost anything you, you know so anyway so uh, I couldn't find on video the first debate I found a, a transcript of it but not a video but uh, that's uh, that's what uh, you know Gary told me on that so bottom line is the book is. Um, um, from a Christian perspective, how many of you are new? This is your first time to be at the Atheist Christian Book Club. One, two, There's three. There's seats over here. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, there's two wooden chairs. Have we used the, up the wooden chairs yet? Too? No, there's the wooden chairs are still. There's still one. I see one of them right there. So I think there's the one chairs more. are back there. Uh, Did you could probably be right where you are, but actually have a seat. And then there's we vegetable have the, seating um, beyond that. Uh, <laughs> 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 That's right out there. Do you have plenty of room now? Yeah. Well, you were sitting in that, right? I was, so, then I moved. Is that good? Yeah. I'm going to get my jacket up. Do you want this chair? Yeah, we have it right here. There's another one, even. Okay. This is a good problem to have, but there's a problem. Right there. So, uh,. Those who are new, um, we do this as first Friday of every month. We, we alternate, almost always. We, I think we have so much, so far, always. Atheist book, Christian book, atheist book, Christian book. So we'll be looking at an atheist book. We have one in mind. We always are open to suggestions, alternatives, and things like that. Bill and I try to get something picked out ahead of time, which we've got one. I think will be dovetailed really, really well with some of the issues that were brought up in the flu book. Uh, but... Uh, uh, I was set, telling some others here that uh, I've, I, I'm a, coming from a Christian perspective, and I've had a relationship with the Metroplex Atheist due to Bill. Uh, due to Julio. Due to Julio. So indirectly, Julio is kind of the grandfather of this yes. whole thing, you could say. So uh, Bill came to see me when I was speaking at Cottonwood. What, what town is What city is that in? Cottonwood uh, Creek. Allen. In Allen. Yeah, Cottonwood Creek in mm -hmm. Allen. And um, he was doing, he, he was functioning um, unofficially as like Metroplex Atheist's outreach director, is the way he explained it to me. So, um, uh, unofficial outreach director. And he said he wanted to ask me if they, if he could do, if they could do a Meet an Atheist Sunday at Cottonwood. Well, I'm the guest, I'm not, that's not my church. I can't give you an okay on that, you know. So it's like, uh, I'm just a guest here, just like you. And so, but he's, he was kind enough to stay for the sermon and was very uh, you know, complimentary. Oh, yeah. He said he enjoyed it and stuff like that. So he said, uh, you live in Arlington. There's this thing called the, the, the Fellowship of the Metroplex Atheists. And I said, really? And he said, yes, it's a place called Gilligan's. I said, Gilligan's, I, I would walk. I wouldn't even get in the car. It's just right down the street. So uh, Bill came by. And this was, what, two years, three years ago? Three years ago, about. Came by and... Um, uh, we sat, talked for about an hour in my office, and he took me down. We went down there, and he introduced me to that time the president, Randy uh, Word. Word, was president at the time, and some others. And and for uh, the for about a year, at least once or twice a month, I would go up.
there we have all kinds of good conversations. And we've kind of moved that now to hooligans, and everybody's welcome to come to hooligans. It's usually every other Thursday. It runs from 4 to 8, and it is a um, – most people don't stay. I mean, you can come in for one hour, half an hour, whatever, but it kind of goes for, from 4 to 8 p.m. Uh, and Hooligans is right next to Gilligan's, right down the street. There's just a pub, and uh, you're, you're welcome to go to that. But anyway, Bill was after me for quite a while to do something, and so we kind of hit on the idea of the book club. Uh, but I already had a relationship with most of the atheists that were here, and we were already friends – pretty much friends at that point, much better friends now, I would think. So we are not here to uh, attack or to uh, ridicule. Uh, don't you don't hold back. I mean, we, we, get in, we get intense conversations in here sometimes, but always respectful and uh, friendly, friendly conversation. In fact, I would say it's not friendly conversation. We're beyond that. We are friends at this point. So um, that's kind of what we're what we try to do on this. It's helpful for me. Because you get real stale if you don't hear any new ideas, or, or and you don't get you, you don't get challenged. And, and this is a, a thing that I've shared with some of you guys before. But uh, I noticed that all my ideas sound brilliant in church. Uh, so get outside, get in a get in a place like this. I find out some of my ideas are not as good as others. So this helps me. It helps me. I think be a better thinker. I hope I hope I'm a better thinker. And. Uh, it also builds some fellowship, both with Christians and atheists. I'm surprised about how much uh, I find I have a lot more in common than I thought I did on a lot of different issues. Uh, and uh, uh, one thing about the people that come to this club, typically, uh, even though if we're on opposite sides of the issue, we all agree this is the issue. I mean, this is everything. Right, everything stands or falls on this question: Is there a God? And uh, it, it affect your worldview affects everything that you do and the way you think. And so I'm glad that you're willing to take time out of your uh, month, a uh, day a month, to do this, plus the time to read the book. So um, anyway, welcome to the club, and uh, we're going to discuss our book uh, this time. And anybody feel free to, uh, you know, Anthony Flew's book, feel free, free to, to uh, hop in at any point. Um, but uh, I wanted to start off maybe by... You know, like Bill, what was your idea as a as a thinking atheist? You read the book, and what was your? Well, I thought his arguments were outstanding. Well, I mean, the fine tuning arguments have always been, you know, pretty formidable to atheists. And uh, you know, when we read Hugh Ross, you know, all those and what he said, just just the profundity of fine tuning arguments. There are just so many of them. I think Hugh Ross is just like three to eight hundred, and. Um, you know, we're just waiting for Chris to get us out of this jam, right? Where's Chris? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. So he's got his notebook. Right? I know everything. Yeah, yeah. so um, how far our unbelief here? Yeah. Um, now that I've been set up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, he, he brought the fine tune argument. That's something that's come up with in multiple books that we've read. It's, everyone, it's very common. Yeah. Um, can, can, you, can you summarize it for those of us? It's who are the there? idea that, you know, there, there's the, there's a lot of math behind the universe. There's a lot of laws of physics. There's a lot of values for universal constants that really need to be just so in order for planets to form, for the Big Bang not to collapse in on itself. Uh, it makes it look like everything had to be, or the, the idea is that there had to be someone arranging those numbers in the perfect way, otherwise we wouldn't have a universe, we wouldn't have life. Um, the, the, the science behind that is weird, and I'm not an expert in it by any sense, but he kind of goes into, the only way you can combat that is to go to multiverse theory, and multiverse theory is unproven, it's speculative, which is true, we haven't figured out a way to break out of our universe and see what other universes have going on, but that's part of the problem for the fine-tuning argument, in my mind. Also, we don't have other universes to compare against. We only have this one. We don't know, like, the, the way it's always presented by apologists is that the Big Bang goes boom, and that exact second, a whole bunch of dials are being spun. One for the force of gravity, one for the strong magnetic force, one for the weak magnetic force, and all these dials are being spun. And... They're trying to act like they all had to line up perfectly or else we get nothing. 
and the fact that they coincidentally all landed on the same number, on the right numbers, means there's a god sitting in that way. But he never establishes that there are dials at all. He never establishes that it could be any different. For all we know, those numbers could be an inherent part of what it means to be a universe, just as a number three is inherent in what it means to be a triangle. And uh, that, that's the way I, I tend to come at those. those uh, so did you find those arguments compelling to find tuning arguments? Well, for, for the reason I just stated, I mean, it, it comes up... I mean, maybe there's a scientific, um, there's more scientific mm -hmm. stuff here going on that I'm just not aware of. It's certainly possible, but it, it seems like it's based on assumptions that, you know, it's because we have numbers means that we have a range of numbers that we could be working with. And, uh, and, but yeah. going back to a, a causeless event, though. Right. The, the well, that's, 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 entirely, that's, a, that's an entirely different. Yeah, no, I was just kind of triggered by something you said there, but I, I don't mean to sidetrack you from the main trigger. point here, right? But you sound uh, like it's, it's yeah. like hitting the lottery the numbers. Well, that, that, that's how apologists typically present it. I'm not buying it. Well, that's no, what, and James has said, I thought was a good comment, that you don't have to hit the lottery one time, you've got to hit it several times. Isn't that what you said? To me, it's compelling because. I think this is why everybody that I read, Krauss and everybody else, is so quick to run multiverse because they realize the problem here. Assuming that there's one universe, let's just, just assume that for a minute, and you only have one Big Bang, it's remarkable that you have that matter, energy, space, and time coming to existence and, and some powerful explosion. And I just you rarely see explosions create order. It, it, it is not just... just Something came into existence. Everything did. And so to me, it's like you only have one bang. So I think the multiverse is a way of saying, well, if there's an infinite number of universes, and let's say they all explode differently, one of them does hit exactly right. At least one, the one we're in. And the very fact that we're observing, and I've heard that argument, means that um, uh, it makes sense because a universe that couldn't form carbon and couldn't form carbon-based life, there would be no observers to complain about it. So, uh, so yes, the fact that we observe means that you can't have a universe, which means that it's, it's, it's possible apart from God. But if you're just going to make up some imaginary, and I don't mean to uh, make fun of the theory, but if you multiverse is just a made-up thought, and I mean, if you're going to do that, you could just make up a bunch of other reasons why God exists or for any other argument that you wanted to put forward. Yeah, what, what, what is multiverse? Well, the I, I concept like your understanding of that there are... Multiple to the infinite numbers of universes existing, and like I, they always say, dimensions. You know, it's kind of hard for me to say conceive of what that is, right? But that's that is my understanding. That's uh, one possible way to look at it. Another yeah. way to look at it is um, it's everything that's just beyond the cosmic microwave background radiation, just extending out to infinity. So, like, we can't see beyond where light has been, it's got an absolute speed limit, but it doesn't mean that the universe doesn't extend to infinity beyond the uh, background uh, radiation there. Yeah, yeah. true. The observable the universe is expanding, but what's on the other side of it? That's, mm -hmm. right? And there's, uh, there are other theories about what is possible, what is causing what appears to be expansion. Other theories, maybe it isn't expanding, depending on uh, a lot of, you know, just weird factors like, you know, qu quarks and quantum fields and God particles and whatever, Higgs bosons and you know, things like that. You know, it's, it's in the realm of we don't know. I don't know. I haven't done the experiments. So I could ask Chris a question, and I know who we are. I saw your hand up, so maybe come to you after. So on that thought, would, would you consider the the fine tuning a variation of God of the Gaps? Yeah, I, I think it falls into. Well, I don't know if this is specifically God of the Gaps, but it's a science doesn't know, but we know because we believe in God. And I think that comes up multiple times in this book and other arguments. Also, the idea that the fact that uh, science doesn't have all the answers and may not ever have all the answers means that uh, that's somehow a victory for the Christian side, or the theist side, I should say. 
Yeah. 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 Just real quick, I was going to say, where did you get the numbers from? Which numbers? The number four, like the probability factor of all this X. So. No, the they're the constants. Measurable. The gravitational constant has a specific number. The electromagnetic force between okay. the weak and you. We, we, we had a whole book we dealt, two books actually we dealt with early in the club where, where we really dug into that. And, oh, uh, that's why I don't. That, that, that's why, but it is basically okay. amazing that you had the, the Christian astronomer um, uh, Hugh Ross and the um, you know the atheist uh, cosmologist uh, Lawrence Krauss, and I was amazed that it seemed like eighty percent or more they were agreeing with each other. As they were talking about the science, the age of the universe, expansion rates, you know, and, and in fact, Krauss's whole book is trying to answer that question, how can you get a whole universe out of nothing? And uh, I think uh, uh, Sam mentioned this, that he was disappointed in the book because he felt that, that uh, Lawrence Krauss equivocated, starting off by, this is what nothing, nothing, and this is why it's important, because there was no matter, energy, space, or time before the singularity. But then halfway through the book, he kind of redefines nothing as very much something. Dark energy, dark matter. Space, or, time, quantum yeah, vacuum. Quantum vacuum, yeah. Which are highly unstable, apparently. Yeah. So, but anyway, that, that's, we, we've had a whole history on that, which is unfair to try to, to, try to expose you guys. Uh, <coughs> well, some, some, but there's something called six yeah. numbers, which are incredible. <laughs> These six numbers have to be precisely just, fine tuned. Just the, the rate of expansion when the first millisecond, if it's off by a fraction, and this book, Krauss says this too, the atheist, then you not only don't get planet stars that need it for planets, you don't even get the periodic table. You only get hydrogen and helium, that's basically all you get. And so if it's too much, then then th these these elements can't form, the periodic table. If it's too little, the universe collapses back on itself. And what's, if I'm understanding Chris correctly, what what uh, Chris is saying is we don't know the answer to that, uh, neither the Christian nor the atheist. Yeah, right. So it, it's really, uh, it, it, you know, where Flew would, would say that he, he changed his position, that it, it, it seems to him that something intelligent is behind it. Um, That's just a guess. Is, 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 it, would be a, it would be fair to say that would be a, a guess on his part as well as on the part of the atheist and how it happened. Sorry, what was the... In other words, the God of the gaps. We don't. We don't. Know, we don't know. Um, science could later on come up with an explanation for that. Yeah, I mean, we. It's, there's been a long history of things being ascribed to gods that uh, turn out later to be the result of natural processes, and I, I don't know if we discover something that points to God later, but that has not been the trend. The trend usually is uh, pointing away from God. I would disagree with that. I would think that the physics is more pointing towards some of these creationist arguments that Flew is putting forward. And, I think, and that certainly includes interpretation of, of others. Which well, I, I should have said that's the way he looks at it. Didn't he too? I, 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 could see, I could see where you know all these discoveries only raise more questions. And uh, I see the uh, I can see the appeal of looking at things that way, but that's like literally the definition of God gaps is whatever gaps in scientific knowledge are. You put God in there and as scientific knowledge expands, God is fluid. He just flows into whatever the new gaps are. But it, it certainly could be coincidental, and I'm not I'm not saying this proves tr anything's true or not, but it, but it is interesting that the ancient you know theologians were talking about a universe out of nothing, which sounded great until the Enlightenment comes along. And then you have the steady state model, and then it seems like all, almost all scientists were saying, you know, everybody knows that matter can either be created or destroyed. We all know we have an eternal universe. And so this idea of God's creating out of nothing is ridiculous, but it does seem like modern cosmology is saying, well, no, the universe did come out of something that's not matter, energy, space, or time. Something that's immaterial, maybe not spiritual might not be, the best term for it, but something immaterial at least, because the, the all matter is the effect, not the cause. Yeah, that's why I would say it's not necessarily God of the gaps, because you're not saying, well, I guess some people could be saying, like, I'm 100% sure. It's just like Occam's razor is in light of all the information we have, what is the most probable? Um, and so to me, I would say, well, it just seems more probable that God, uh, God exists and set these things into place specifically on this argument, not even bringing the other ones, but it's not like 100% truth, and saying like, 
well, eventually science is just going to tell us is to me just the God of the gaps. You just replace God with science. Well, it's always going to be easier to say God did something. Sometimes the truth is complicated. Like I started today in Phoenix and I wound up here. Fair. So is, is it more easier to say that I got driven to the airport, took a plane, and got driven here, or to say that God proved me here? It's easier to say God proved me here. I think. Proven. Where were the evidence? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But see, it's in light it's of all luggage. the evidence, not in spite of. That's my point. Do you know the evidence? Have you done the experiments? Are you asking if I've gone through and done everything? No, of course I am not. You have to, at some point, everybody stands on the shoulder of giants. And there's no way anybody here can pretend like they've done every experiment in every field. That's and actually my point, is that we don't know. These people, they've done, they're in a better position, maybe, to know, but we don't know what they know. We can't really confirm or deny their positions or their assessments or their mathematics. We don't know the math. We don't know the science. We don't know the theories. We're not part of the discourse. We're just kind of out here on the fringes guessing and to, it seems silly to me to just like stamp one way or the other. And, and, I, and I say that, you know, somebody stamping it one way. Yeah, like so it would it would be ridiculous saying, just, just saying, oh yeah, Big Bang, or yeah, multiverse, or yeah, this, or yeah, that. We don't know. So, so basically, so Sam, so basically, we're we're both we're we got a lot in common. We're both putting our faith in something. No, I'm we're saying like we're, we're trusting. Well, let me I'm rephrase trusting. that. We're both trusting in something. I mean, you're you're obviously trusting a uh, some data, some scientific, some it's scientist work. All I'm doing is saying I know what these guys have said. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm doing. Just reporting what I know that they said. That's all I can do. That's all any of us can well, do. Well, Hugh Ross, his, <laughs> his reasons.org, and he lists the 600 fine tuning arguments, and he has a testable creation model. So he's more of a scientist type, and he's an older author, so he's with the consensus of science, but he says he, can, he has a model that he can prove. Whereas someone that I can answer suggests are just going to say, uh, yeah, just believe it and let, be done with it. What are we going to say? I think uh, the important thing here is to say, is it just people with a Christian bias who are making the claims for these numbers, these, these constants, these uh, variables in the universe, or are they in agreement with non-Christian scientists? And in the case of the fine-tuning arguments, there's widespread agreement. Uh, Completely across, regardless of personal world. View. Right. I, you know, I, Let me give I, you an I hear Christians say that, but from what I understand, I don't think that that's really the case. Well, we, I can't prove that here tonight. Because, because what, what, like, for instance, one of the common things that I hear is like, they'll say, they'll point to some constant, and you know, how many zeros are after the decimal. You know, this is blah, 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 blah. The reason why they result in these weird numbers and that's is because the units are arbitrary units based upon human experience. When you work the math backwards, starting from those constants, the numbers work out quite a bit differently. It's not as uh, cut and dry that like, oh, these were like tweaked to some like weird decimal place. It's like, no, it's, it appears to be in this position and it works with the math, but we don't have a causal explanation for why this thing needs to be here, or even what it Working is. Working back to what number? I, I got sort of, yeah. that seemed a little vague. And my I mean, what, I, what, I mean what, what I mean is, is you, that's take, really what, you take what it is as being measured, and rather than <coughs> defining it as, you know, seconds squared over meters squared per uh, kiloparsec or something like that, you flip it around and you define it in terms of its geometry and assign it a value of one and where does the rest of the math result from there. And things come out a little bit. You don't think our math is based on the way reality is pi or e or other such constants on, on, well, on those based on observations of the universe as it is. 
They are. I mean, they're not arbitrary. No, like the gravitational constant, it's like nine numbers long. They would all agree on that constant. Yeah, we all agree on the math. Consensus. Consensus. That's what it is. Take a look at the And to make this more concrete, just to take one example out of the 600 that I mentioned or one of the six or eight really big ones in terms of the universe. The, the force that holds protons together in the nucleus of every atom, that's a weak force, that's a strong force. The strong force. Yep. Possibly things repel each other. If that isn't exactly perfect, then every, if it were off like one part in a trillion, many trillions, either stronger or weaker, everything would be hydrogen, one proton, one electron, or nothing. There'd be no periodic table. And this is something scientists don't disagree with. Yeah, I, I, even the, the atheist science do, do say that there's the appearance of that. But when, but when the And scientists point, don't agree on that. Uh, how, can, yes. how do you know that? And how do you know that they do? But Sam, your whole yeah. argument seems to be always just, we can't know anything. And, and if that's, that's not true, and if that's where we go, what then we why are we even having a conversation? that we can know something. This is what we know, and it's focusing on, okay, what do we actually so know? So what is the Rather this that we know? In this, specific, in this specific argument, what is the this that we know that we can start on? It's better to focus on what you individually know. That's the point. So since we can't know what, uh, what scientists worldwide agree on, then it's not valid? It may or may not be. And this is I don't think there's any question as to what the constants are. That's not to me personally. But how do you interpret those constants? Yeah, it's very much. Absolutely. Let me make my point a little bit different way. Because Connor mentioned pi. Pi is a constant. Every circle. Has that number of 3.14, et cetera, et cetera. Except for square circles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> um, but, so, so, so pi is a constant. Without, if pi were a little bit off, we wouldn't have any circles. Do you think God oh. set the value for pi? No, no I wasn't making that point. I was making that point. I know I am making that point. Like, like D, for example, is based on you know, natural every, every so so observation of nature. So it's not so how, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a physics. It, it, it's, it's, a way, it's a way of describing how the mathematical relationship between a circle and its things. And that's and philosophers carry on and on about whether math existed. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. Flew we'll both get into that. But yeah. Yeah. my point is, it, it's our way. It, it's not something that someone wrote down someday, and that's how circles right. work. That, that's our. That's the number. That's how we figured out. Yeah. Well, I see what you're saying. Let me finish if I can. Uh, kind of give us a little break here on, on the discussion. Very good discussion so far, by the way. Uh, I did, uh, uh, if you read in the book, you probably saw Gary Habermas, who's a professor at uh, philosophy at the Liberty University. Uh, to, he's the one that you saw, somebody saw the debate. There were three debates that he did. But what happened is Habermas also spent many, many hours. They became very close friends with, with Anthony Flew. And, and basically, they would have long dinners before and after the debates and, and, and conversations and, and calls back and forth to, to, to uh, the UK. And uh, Gary was, was with him through the whole process of beginning to question uh, his, his uh, worldview. And so I asked, since Anthony Flew has obviously passed away, I asked Gary, who's a friend of mine, if he'd be willing uh, to come into the club, address the club, and talk about some of the things that aren't in the book, maybe. What were those conversations like? And so I've got a, a little three-part, you know, thing. We'll get as much as we can done. I think the first one's about eight minutes. So you guys will see that and yeah. hear from Gary Habermas. Hello, my name is James Walker, and I'm president of Watchman Fellowship, a Christian apologetics ministry, but I'm also the co-founder of the Atheist Christian Book Club. This is a group of about uh, 20 to 30 of us, about half Christians and half atheists, and we meet monthly for a meal together, and we discuss important books from both, from both perspectives, atheist and Christian. Um, my guest today 
is Dr. Harry Habermas. He's a historian, a New Testament scholar. He's the distinguished professor of apologetics and philosophy at Liberty uh, University. He's also a leading Christian scholar uh, in the area of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jerry, thanks for joining us. Glad to be here with you. Well, later this week, our club's meeting, and we're going to be discussing this book by Anthony Flew called uh, There Is a God. And Anthony Flew, of course, was probably uh, one of the 20th century's leading academic atheists, very, uh, uh, very notorious atheist in academic settings. And uh, he's debated a number of Christians through the years on the topic of atheism versus Christianity, including. Uh, including you, and so uh, we've asked you to come on and talk a little bit about that. Obviously, he made a conversion to believing that there is a God uh, before his uh, his death a, couple, a, a number of years ago. Uh, but you debated him when he was an atheist, but you also developed a, a friendship with him. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got to know Anthony Flew? Sure. In 1985, I attended a series of debates in Dallas. And it was put together by Roy Varghese. And I think it was called Christianity Con Confronts the University or something like that. And probably, I mean, I've never heard anything comparable, but in that weekend, it might have been like a Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, there were about 35 people involved in debates, sometimes four on four, sometimes two on two. But there were a whole bunch of debates on what we have come today to call intelligent design. Uh, is the New Testament reliable? Is morality based on an absolute standard? And so on. And, of course, I'd known Anthony Flew's name for many years. When I was in graduate school, when I was in undergraduate school, back in the 60s and early 70s, Flew was just, was just the, the big name. Uh, now, I didn't go to Trinity, but people who went to Trinity Seminary told me that they couldn't take a philosophy class without Tony Flew's books being required. And so there he was, as big as life, up there on the stage, and he was part of a four-on-four a -four debate on God's existence. Four atheist philosophers, four theistic philosophers. And, of course, he was the outstanding name on the atheist side. And on the Christian side, Alvin Plantinga was the uh, big name. And uh, so I watched him on stage, and uh, really interesting. And that night, my uh, good friend Terry Meathy said to Tony, hey, how would you like to go out and get a bite to eat? And he said, sure. And we walked outside the hotel and down the street to a restaurant. And at that restaurant, uh, Terry initiated a discussion on the resurrection. And Tony and I both kind of jumped in. And started talking. And after we talked for maybe 10 minutes, Terry said, whoa, 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 whoa. This is going way too well. Why don't we stop the discussion now and not spoil it? And Tony, if we got an invitation for you to come to Liberty University, would you come and debate? And he said, sure. Well, that was in early um, February or March 85. He came in May. And we had our first debate which was published in a book by Harper and Rowe at that time, they were called, Harper and Rowe, and it was called The Jesus Rise from the Dead. And so Tony and I debated, and we debated two more times, but that was my introduction. I went to Dallas to hear him debate, had the dinner, and that changed into our own debate at Liberty University. Great, great. So um, the, the debate, and I've got to listen to part of that one. Uh, I've listened to the entire, I think it was the second debate that you did on the John Ankerberg show. Fascinating. And uh, I think there was a third debate as well? A third debate that uh, I, I think it was a Veritas forum at uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo on the West Coast at the, at the Secular University. And uh, we did the we debated the resurrection once again. Well, um we shared the link, at least to that middle debate, the John Ankerberg Show debate, uh, with our whole club, the Atheists and Christians, and I don't know how many have gotten to watch it. But I understand that you actually uh, would spend some time with uh, Ant with uh, uh, Dr. Flew off stage. in other words, like after the debate or before the debate. Uh, could you give me a little bit of idea, give us an idea of what those discussions were like? Sure. 
Yeah, he and I actually got to be quite good friends, and it ended up in the last, oh, five, six years of his life. He and I would just call periodically, well, I would call him, and I would call him on the phone, and it got to the point where if his wife answered the phone, she didn't even ask who it was. She just said, oh, Gary, I'll, I'll go get Tony for you, and, and that's how it went. And he was sitting in a study like this one, and uh, and we discussed. I do I do remember walking off the stage in the one you're talking about, the John Ankerberg performance. And he and I, as I often say, we went off to do the unmanly thing of taking our makeup off. And um, they gave us this pink Vaseline goop stuff to wipe off the, the stuff they put on your face, the powder for uh, television. And as we were walking back to that room, he leaned over. We were alone in the hallway. And he leaned over and said something to me. And I heard him, heard him very clearly. But I couldn't believe what I heard. And I said, what? And he leaned back over and said it to me again. And here's his words, James. They were so amazing. He said, like, like it had just dawned on him. He said, I have no evidence for my position. Wow. And I, and I said, what? And he said, yeah, I have no evidence for my position. And we kept discussing as we walked down the hallway into the room to get the makeup taken off. But I was just, I was stunned by his comment. Wow. That he was, he was apparently used to, like so many philosophies, he was used to doing negative apologetics. You're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, here's where you're wrong, here's where you're wrong. But when someone said to him, how do you know atheism's right? Which I think he'd been asked, because after that debate, there was Q&A from the crowd who had come to watch the broadcast. And he was asked that question, and it just dawned on him that all he was doing was... That's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, this wrong. But he's never stopped. And here I have been given evidence for the resurrection for a couple hours, and he didn't think he had any evidence to give for his atheism. It was a truly amazing moment to me. I don't know that I had heard that before anywhere else. I'm, I'm sure maybe he's published it somewhere. I had not heard about that part of the conversation. Uh, he wasn't, I don't think Flew was trying to say he had no evidence for what he was saying. I think he was just saying, I've only been giving evidence against theism. I've not really been putting forth evidence. I, I, I talked to Gary after the interview a little bit of this too, uh, and I think it's we, we addressed it a little bit also in the second second part of the interview that uh, Flew, um, his, he, he championed this position of uh, the assumption of atheism. That with a, a eternal universe, given enough time and chance, we have we have a. It's reasonable to expect that everything we see could be explained uh, apart from God. So his argument that's a brute fact. That's something that we we start with atheism, and then it's incumbent upon the uh, the theist to bring overwhelming evidence to get us off of that base. And I I think when he came to the place where he realized that. Uh, there's a good possibility the universe is not eternal. It's uh, then at that point he began to rethink this again. I, I don't want to put words in his mouth on that, but I, I think that might be part of that story. So what, what do you think of the interview, Andy? Bill, what do you think? Chris, <coughs> help us out here, Chris. Uh, well, I, I was just trying to look up in the book to see where he was talking about that. Because he wrote, he, was he, he wrote the book Presumption of Atheism. Yes, that was one of his. Um, the way I've always seen described, and y'all can let me know if this makes sense to you now. I mean, I'm not. There's this, there's a difference between knowing and believing. Like I, I would call myself an agnostic, agnostic atheist. I don't believe there's a god. I don't know there's not a god, but I have not been presented with evidence that convinces me there are God. Chris, could you take just a second for us, because that's confused people in the past. I know sure. exactly what you mean, yeah. but elaborate on it a little bit. Um, can anybody really know, can you really prove any negative? There's there's no anything. That, yeah, that, that's... You'd that's almost have to have all knowledge. You'd have to yeah. know everything about everything. 
Yeah, and, and that, that's the principle that uh, atheists use a definition of argue. I also have a colloquial definition of agnostic of someone who's just not sure, is kind of fuzzy on things. I think that, that can be confusing also. And you definitely have people who will assert that they know for a fact that there is no God. And if they're making that claim, that's when you need to have evidence for uh, what you're asserting. Just as if you're a theist and say, I know 100% that there is a God, you have the burden of proof to present evidence for that position. If you're saying, I don't I don't believe, I might believe if there was evidence presented, but so far not to come up, then you don't need to assert anything in that case. You just have to evaluate the evidence. That makes sense to everybody, what he's saying? Yeah, yeah. So it's good. So yeah, I, mean, I, I don't know if, I don't know if, pre-conversion flu would have described himself as a I know 100% there is no God. And well, he probably what, wouldn't be a fundamentalist atheist. That we always talk about that. What's you know, a, right? if, if I, if if I would you ask Julio, Julio, okay, <laughs> what, what do we mean by the term, what do you mean by the term fundamentalist atheist? I know what a fundamentalist atheist is. That's a subject of that topic, so. <laughs> <laughs> it could make me mad. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. never mind. <laughs> yeah, well, he's, well, Todd, Todd is a uh, member that we may have built both now, and we, he always likes to say I'm a fundamentalist atheist because he's like, we well, get together with other atheists and you do stuff and blah 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 blah. You got your books. It's almost like your, a religion. It's yeah. Like a religion. And I'm We're a canon of yeah, like exactly. the God delusion, and and he'd say uh, Dawkins is a fundamentalist atheist. I think in the yeah. book. He but is. even basically, oh, if you're a strong atheist, atheist, then like a strong atheist, 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 is kind of like some people who said it's a fundamental atheist. Okay. Just can, you, can you give us definition of a strong atheist versus a weak atheist? Top of my head, I would say, um, like, um, Richard Dawkins, for example, would be like a good example of a strong atheist. But even on Dawkins, I think he would agree with Chris, because Dawkins, now he, does, he doesn't say there is no God, he says there probably is well, no God. I don't know if you guys ever heard of the Dawkins scale, like, or it kind of like leads to this thing people have been going around about. Whereas like one is like hundred percent sure you know there's a god. Seven is like you're hundred percent sure there is not a god. And nobody falls from one or seven. We all fall yeah. somewhere in between that spectrum. <coughs> Where would you put yourself? Six point nine. Six point nine. Can we talk you into uh, six point eight? Uh, this, uh, this, uh, this might be a good take take a break, stretch your legs a little bit. There's coffee in there, I believe. I'll make them some more if there's not, and let's come back maybe in about um, about uh, ten minutes. Is this our group?